All right, we'll go ahead and get started for today. So if this is your first time attending, um, welcome to the Greener Backyard and Environmental Stewardship Workshop Series. Uh, we meet on Fridays from four to five. This is the fourth um, meeting in a series of five. So this week we'll be covering rain barrels and next week we'll be covering microplastics. Um, you can sign up for these sessions on the library website, or you can also reliably use this meeting ID and password to get into the meeting every week. Uh, so just a little introduction in case you haven't been on before. My name is Alora, and I'm a New Jersey Watershed Ambassador um, with AmeriCorps, and this is a program focused on environmental and watershed education and stewardship. So we educate the public about different environmental topics, um, and we also go out and do stream assessments where we um, assess macroinvertebrate populations and habitat environments and make sure that the streams of New Jersey are doing good. Um, so to go ahead and get started for today, um, we'll be talking about rain barrels, which is a really interesting topic actually because it's a part of a much bigger topic um, relating to stormwater management. So what is a rain barrel? So these are containers of various different sizes that you actually attach to the gutter downspout from a building. So that can be your house, it can be a business, um, anything really that has a gutter downspout. And it's going to temporarily store rainwater. And you can either use that rainwater or you can allow it to simply slow down stormwater runoff by capturing it and then later releasing that, that stormwater. Um, so the bigger topic for today is actually stormwater runoff and how we manage it. And so rain barrels are just one aspect of that. So we're going to delve a bit more into stormwater runoff and the different aspects of that. So basically stormwater runoff uh, comes from the watershed. So anywhere that you are on the planet, you're actually in a watershed. So if you're in New Jersey in... Um, you know, a half of Sussex County, you might be in the Walk Hill watershed, whereas if you are, um, you know, down in Hudson County, you might be a part of a different watershed. So these areas are confined by local geography. So whatever that landscape is in the area, it's going to essentially uh, determine how that water is flowing and how it's being collected. And so your watershed, despite being um, bound by local geography includes you and me, and it includes all of the things um, both natural and not natural. So this includes streams, rivers, creeks, lakes, but it also includes things like our houses and our businesses and the animals that live in them. Um, so as it rains or precipitates in any form, so recently we've had a lot of snow, um, and that snow melts, melts which, which creates what's called um, uh, snow melt, all of that precipitation is going to collect and it's guided by that local geography. So it's going to run over the hills and the valleys and it's going to fill up our streams and creeks and eventually it's going to flow into a common body of water. And that, that ability for water to collect in a common source, that's the, the watershed. So um, if your water all collects in the Hudson River, then you're in the Hudson River watershed. And so in New Jersey, um, I'm sorry for those out of state, I don't have the information for that, but for New Jersey, we have a total of 20 different watersheds. So we're up here in watershed number two, which is the Walk Hill River watershed. Um, if you're close in other parts of Sussex County, you might actually be in watershed number one, which is the upper Delaware. Um, but if you're coming from different parts of the state, um, you can figure out which watershed you're in based on your location. You can actually go on NJGeoWeb to figure out which watershed you live in. Um, so again, we have 20 watersheds in New Jersey and we have five watershed regions. So you have the Northwest 
region, the Northeast, the Raritan, Lower Delaware, and the Atlantic coast. And these are all kind of guided by that local topography. So the Atlantic coast, this is all kind of low-lying coast, um, whereas we're up kind of in the mountains and the valleys um, up here in the Northwest. Um, as you can see, watershed number two is pretty small, as are many of the other ones in the Northeast and Raritan area. Um, but I'm going to talk a little more specifically about watershed number two, which is the Walk Hill River watershed. So this is a pretty small watershed, and actually it's only small in New Jersey because most of it lies in New York. Um, so we have the uh, beginning of the Walk Hill River watershed in Sparta, New Jersey at Lake Mohawk. Now Lake Mohawk is a man-made lake that once had just a natural spring there that gave rise to the Walk Hill, but now we have this big lake, Lake Mohawk, that um, serves as the headwaters for the Walk Hill River. And so you'll see that this river actually flows northward, which is actually quite unique compared to other streams. They tend to flow southward. Um, but regardless of a stream flowing north or south, it's always following gravity. So it's actually flowing downwards here, even though it's flowing northward. And so the, the river flows for over 70 miles and it empties in about Kingston, New York. And around this area, it meets what's called the Roundout Creek. Um, and now the Roundout Creek and the Walk Hill River combined make up the largest tributary to the Hudson River. Um, and all a tributary is, is essentially a river or collection of rivers that then connects to a bigger river. So here, the Hudson River, um, this is a very big river, right, uh, flows up most of New York and then down into the New York Bay area by New York City. Um, so we make up a big contribution to that um, much larger watershed. So you can see here that even though we're in this small watershed, it's connected to a larger watershed. So what we do in our watershed um, not only matters locally, it matters on a much larger scale to those watersheds in which we're um, a, a smaller part of. Um, and so a lot of the things that are um, influencing our stormwater runoff is actually the presence or absence of pervious and impervious surfaces. So pervious just means that water can flow through it, whereas impervious means that water is not able to flow through it. So those pervious surfaces are things like natural forests, um, gardens, green roofs even, whereas impervious surfaces are things like buildings, houses, parking lots, and roads. And when water is unable to penetrate the ground, it flows over the top of it, right? And that's how we get potential for flooding. And that's also how we get stormwater runoff, um, which is where we, we want to start thinking about, well, what is that water picking up? What is being transported in that water as it's flowing over those different surfaces of the planet, right? Whether that's our pervious surfaces like forests and natural grounds, or if that's parking lots and roads. Um, and so there's two different broad kinds of pollution. And so these are classified as non-point and point source pollution. So non-point source pollution, um, we generally explain this as you couldn't put your finger on it, right? So if you're standing in a river, but you see that there's high levels of nitrogen, you couldn't point anywhere and say, this is exactly where that nitrogen is coming from. Whereas with point source pollution, you could say, oh, that pollution is coming from a, a pipe that originates from a factory. So point source quite literally means you could point to it and that is the source, whereas non-point is kind of the, the pollution is originating from all over the place and that most people are going to have a play in that that pollution generation and its transport. So there's lots of different kinds of non-point source pollution that we should be aware of. So I'll start over here with agriculture. So it's not uncommon for agricultural uh, um, establishments to use pesticides and fertilizers fertilizers for their crops. Um, the one thing about pesticides and fertilizers is that they often contain uh, nitrogen and phosphorus. And these two elements play a really big role in food chains. Um, and so they can lead to um, an 
over enrichment of nutrients in a system, which can then knock that system out of balance. But on top of pesticides and fertilizers, we can also say that animal waste can come from agriculture, such as um, from raising cattle. And so their waste is going to produce a form of pollution. And that's also going to not only be rich in perhaps nitrogen, it might also be rich in bacteria. And so bacteria um, can flow into our water and that can serve as a source of pollution and is obviously something that um, can serve a threat to our water security if it's a bacteria that is contagious and can cause uh, harm. Another source of pollution is septic systems. Um, so if they're not properly maintained, the septic systems can get leaks. And so human waste, much like other animal waste, it can be rich in nutrients, but it can also um, be rich in bacteria. And so the more nitrogen and bacteria you have, the more likely it is that it's going to get into your, um, your water. And so when it rains, right, the all these different pollutants, these nutrients, they seep into the ground or they go over it and they essentially flow towards the nearest body of water. Perhaps that's a creek or a stream in your yard or maybe that's a really big river. But ultimately all of it's going to end up, um, that, that non-point source pollution is going to end up in water and connecting ultimately to the ocean. Another uh, source of pollution is from wastewater treatment plants. So these plants, overall are doing a great service for us. They're processing our water and making sure we have clean water. The thing about wastewater treatment plants though is that they just have standards for what can be um, released into the environment. So this is an example of point source um, pollution. So they're going to have um, a pipe of some sort that is going to release, release water back into the environment. It will inevitably contain um, bacteria, for example, and it's just whether or not those wastewater treatment plants are meeting what is considered acceptable standards. And the same goes for factories. They can also pr um, serve as a source, source of point source pollution since they can also have piping that goes directly into the environment. Um, there are regulations on what can and cannot be released into the environment. And you may know of something called uh, a super fun site. Um, a lot of times these result from businesses um, oftentimes accidentally producing a chemical that is actually an environmental toxin that is persistent, that requires many years of um, mitigation strategies. Other sources of pollution is just our, our daily establishments, our houses, our cities, our roads. And what can collect on them are any kind of debris we produce. So whether that's plastic pollution or if that's other garbage or food, um, and that can all end up also in our local um, water sources. Another thing I just want to point out here is uh, that's not on this diagram is uh, sediment. So basically, when we start to remove plants and forests, um, we we disassociate those roots from the environment and those roots naturally serve as a net that protects, that actually holds the soil and the sediments in place. So once we take them away, that soil is more likely to erode and go into our water sources. And so that can lead to a lot of different things as well, such as increase in turbidity, which is like the cloudiness of the water. And that can do things like smother organisms that live on the bottom of a river. So to sum that up, point source pollution are things like wastewater treatment plants and factories that have direct pipes um, that, that leak into the environment, whereas non-point source pollution comes from all over the place, like our cities and our homes, our septic systems and agriculture. Um, so just to give you some more examples, uh, this is what sediment might look like um, if it's uh, in uh, stormwater runoff, it would look very brown because it's carrying a lot of sediments. Um, obviously, trash and debris are going to get picked up and carried with that. Bacteria, from mainly from wastes, like human wastes and animal wastes. Um, nutrients, like nitrogen and phosphorus. And of course, from um, vehicles and perhaps changing oils on cars. Oils will naturally rise to the surface when water um, goes onto that um, impervious surface and it will 
get carried along with that water. And now this can have a number of, um, you know, consequences downstream, which we'll talk about in a moment. So the way you want to kind of think of a watershed is it's the land and the area and how it's connected to other water. So whenever it precipitates, whether that's rain, snow, snow melt, um, it's going to run over the land and the mountains. It's going to run over the roads and other impervious surfaces. We'll go into our streams and rivers and ultimately will end up in the ocean. So that's the big takeaway. So locally things matter and also things matter globally as well, right? Because our oceans are all connected. Everything is connected with water, right? So some of the issues with impervious surfaces are flooding and especially urban flooding. So the more urban um, environments or Urban environments have more impervious surfaces like roads, sidewalks, houses, right? And so there's not really a place for that water to go other than to the the um the sewer system, right? Where where the water will flow in through those grates and then it will get transported out to a water source. Um, and so a lot of times we see areas with really bad flooding, and this is becoming a, a pretty big problem, especially um, in areas like Newark. Um, that have so much impervious surface um, and they're also, you know, their infrastructure is not always up to date. So it's really important to th think about what are some mitigation strategies to this? How can we stop so, uh, that some of that water from going onto those surfaces and causing flooding? And along with that transport of water comes lots of different things, right? So when it comes to nutrient pollution, um, and a, a local example is Lake Hapakong, um, this lake gets harmful algal blooms um, pretty regularly. And so harmful algal blooms just mean that cyanobacteria in the water, they really feast on that nitrogen and phosphorus. It makes their populations bloom. And so what happens is that they can take over an area pretty easily and kind of create this, this green water, or this like film looking um, substance. And that's, that's the cyanobacteria. And uh, what's particularly concerning about them for public health is that those cyanobacteria can release toxins into the water and some into the air. And they can also deplete the oxygen levels in the water, which can lead to things like fish kills. Um, so here's an example of a fish kill where the oxygen levels get severely depleted in a water body and then those organisms can no longer live there. Um, and red tide is another example of a harmful algal bloom. So over in Florida, they get red tide quite often. Um, and that's again from a surplus of nutrients coming into that system from that non-point source pollution. And again, that can lead to things like fish kills and beaches getting shut down or even lakes uh, getting shut down. So that's just a couple examples. Um, of course, plastic pollution is no surprise. Um, we have a really big problem with plastic here globally. Um, we even have, if you have not heard of this, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, which due to ocean circulation and gyres and things like that, um, a lot of the plastic that has been transported and ended up in the ocean is accumulating in these large masses. Uh, so the Great Pacific Garbage Patch lies between like California and Hawaii. Um, and you can see that the concentration of it um, you know, it's pretty significant towards the center. And then, you know, we see a lot of, it covers a lot of surface area. So the Great Pacific Garbage Patch is more than twice the size of Texas, which is pretty, pretty incredible. Um, so we want to think of, again, stormwater management. And so some of the things that we do for stormwater management are rain barrels. Um, another one is rain gardens. These are really cool too because you really construct a garden that is really beautiful and it collects rainwater much like a rain barrel would except it feeds a garden instead and rain gardens are particularly good at absorbing and holding that water um, before it just goes directly into streams, right? So that when we have uh, those impervious surfaces, the water isn't always just penetrating into the ground, it's riding over the surface. And so a lot of those um, uh, non-point non -point source pollutants are just getting directly carried into local water sources instead of kind of slowly uh, making their way towards uh, the water source. 
And again, we can we can also correct this with something called pervious pavement. Um, so pervious pavement allows water to seep through it and then it gets stored in a, a tank underneath or through um, like layers of rock. And another thing we can do is plant trees, right? Trees help keep sediments in place and they uptake a lot of water. Um, so, so we're going to be focusing here on rain barrels now that we have the backstory here. So this is really a stormwater management technique. Um, and so you can figure out how much storm water is coming off of your roof, for example, um, by using this formula. So you're going to calculate these. Uh, I'm sorry to take everybody back to like high school algebra. <laughs> um, so basically, you just calculate the surface area of your roof in square inches and you multiply by the amount of rainfall. So in New Jersey, the average rain uh, storm is going to produce about an inch of rain. And then you'll divide by this conversion factor, which is 231 cubic inches per gallon. So I'm just gonna walk everybody through a quick um, example. So this house, the roof um, is 16 feet by 40 feet. And so what you do is you convert those feet to inches. So since there's 12 inches in a foot, you just multiply by that conversion factor for both of those. And then what you do is you multiply those inches to get square inches, right? So 192 times 480, that's going to give us approximately 92,000 square inches. And then we'll multiply by the average rainstorm, which is one inch and divide by the conversion factor, which will give us approximately 399 gallons of water. So you can see that quite a bit of, of stormwater runoff is generated off of your roof. Um, this is kind of like a small one. Um, so every rain barrel matters, right? The amount of water you can collect really depends on the size of your roof and how many um, downspouts you're going to collect from. So this example would be if this roof over here, just this side had one uh, gutter downspout, that would be about 400 gallons. But say your roof, this single roof had a downspout here and another one here, you would divide that number in half. So you always want to be mindful when you're calculating this and uh, that you're taking into account the, the gutter down uh, spouts that you have. So this would be for an example of one roof panel with one downspout. And so this is important to know because that can give us an idea of how much water is actually being captured by rain barrels. So when it comes to New Jersey, we get on average 45 inches of rain every year. Um, and sometimes it's higher. So sometimes it's more around like 47. Um, the average uh, roof is going to be about 800 square foot. And that's that size of a roof is going to give us about 500 gallons of runoff in a one inch storm. So if we combine these statistics of 500 gallons and 45 inches of rain per year, um, and an average rain barrel can collect 22, over 22,000 gallons of water per year. Um, and that's if it's properly maintained, meaning that you are, you are using that water or emptying your barrel in between storms. So big takeaway is that every rain barrel counts. Um, so the more people that use rain barrels, the more water we stop from entering the uh, more, the more storm water we prevent from being generated um, and released into the environment during a rainstorm. Now, you want to use this water. I can't stress this enough. Don't use a rain barrel if you're not going to use the water. This is a really big, big thing here. So you want to use your rain barrel water within about two weeks or so of it being collected. Um, and that's because you don't want to encourage al um, algal growth inside of your rain barrel. Um, so you do want to make sure you're using it or either emptying the rain barrel in between storms. So that means slowly, very slowly releasing that water back into the environment. So you might turn your spout on and let the water kind of drip out over a couple days or something like that. I have heard of people actually in the, in the bottom of their rain barrels drilling a very tiny hole and um, that allows a lot of the water to just kind of without any kind of uh, mental attention to it to just 
um, seep out of the bottom of the rain barrel over time so that um, there's room for more water. So again, your goal, use the water or remember to release it into your yard slowly after a rain event. Um, and you can use this water for a lot of different things, right? The first thing to, to really think about is that it's not potable, meaning that you can't drink this water. You don't want to drink rain water. Uh, so it collides with lots of different um, molecules in the air as it's falling down. And uh, our water in New Jersey is on the acidic side. Um, so you do also, um, if, especially if you're going to use this water to like use in koi ponds or something, you just want to make sure you're monitoring um, that. Or, or vegetable gardens that you're monitoring that water to make sure it's it's good for consumption and good for organisms. Um, you can use this water for indoor and outdoor gardening, right? So you can attach to the faucet a hose and then you can spray your, your flowers with it or you can just empty water out into like a watering can and then water your indoor plants with it with other gardens. Uh, you can water your lawn with it fill up your bird baths, wash your car, your dog with it. I thought this was a really creative use of it was uh, during a power outage. If you have water in your rain barrel, you can also use that water to flush your toilet during a power outage. And I really love the idea of uh, drip irrigation, which is shown here on the left. So drip irrigation is where you would attach uh, hoses to the, the faucet of the rain barrel and it has holes in it so that it slowly releases water into your flower beds um, and so it's kind of just um, kind of watering your garden without you really doing anything um, unless you're kind of shutting this faucet off. So there's just some water uses. Um, I encourage everybody to be creative with their water uses. Get the most out of your water that you collect. Um, in terms of maintenance, there is a little bit of maintenance when it comes to rain barrels and the, the biggest maintenance uh, consideration is mosquitoes, right? You don't want mosquitoes to live in your rain barrel. And so uh, you can do a couple of things to prevent this. The number one way um, with or without a rain barrel to prevent mosquitoes is to actually make sure that your gutters get cleaned out regularly. Um, another thing you can do is add vegetable oil to your rain barrel and that oil is going to break the surface tension of the water so that the mosquitoes can't reproduce in it. Um, or you can use what's called a mosquito dunk um, and you could put that in your rain barrel and that'll prevent the mosquitoes from coming. Uh, you also want to make sure that you're cleaning off the top of your rain barrel um, if it's getting covered with leaves or different kinds of debris during rain uh, events. Um, and also, again, remove leaves from your gutters to make sure that water is actually going through your gutters and, and out the downspout. Every season, you should clean your rain barrel once. Uh, you should just wash it with some non-toxic soap, scrub it out and rinse it, and then you can um, leave it in a dry place for over winter. So uh, we don't get too much rain in winter. We get more snow or just cold weather. So, um, and you also don't want the water to uh, freeze and crack your barrel um, during the winter. So it's best to actually disconnect your rain barrel during the winter, empty it out, make sure it's washed, um, and then store it upside down in a dry location so you can bring it back out in the spring. And every season, you want to just make sure that you are checking for structural integrity, making sure that it didn't get cracked, maybe on like an unusually cold night or something like that. And so I'm sure this is the moment everybody's been waiting for, how to build and install a rain barrel. Um, so you can buy a rain barrel. Uh, these usually are, uh, I think I saw some for like around 100 to more, several hundred dollars, um, or you can make one. Um, so to build one, you would need a, at least a 55 gallon food grade plastic barrel. Um, you need a fiberglass screen, um, a three quarter inch brass faucet, a three quarter inch hose adapter, two three quarter inch lock nuts, plumber's tape and silicone caulk. Um, and so these are pretty simple to build. Um, and we'll go into that um, in the next few slides. Um, I have also seen uh, people make these out of um, 
garbage cans before. So you can be creative with it. Um, if you do want to get a 55 gallon food grade plastic barrel, you can reach out to uh, many different companies and they will be happy for the most part to donate them to you. Um, so some sources could be like a food factory such as Coca-Cola or a juice company like Ocean Spray. They might have um, barrels that they're willing to donate. So the first step once you do get a barrel is to wash it. Um, usually they hold things like especially like Coca-Cola and stuff. They These barrels are used to hold syrups and such um, or fruit juices and they can have a really potent fruity or syrupy smell to them. So you want to make sure you scrub them down with soap and water and that you rinse it at least three times. Um, and then what you're going to do is you're going to cut a hole um, in the top of the barrel to put a screen in. Some barrels don't require this. And then you're going to drill two holes, one at the top of the barrel and one towards the bottom of the barrel. And you just want to make sure that these two holes are slightly smaller than your three quarter inch faucet and overflow. Um, so here's, so if you do get a barrel that, that it, where the lid doesn't screw off, you do have to cut, um, a hole or a square, it's up to you. Um, so for these ones that uh, myself and other ambassadors built, um, they had square shaped baskets that are used to capture um, like leaf debris and such. And so we cut out a square shape and we just used a jigsaw to do that. Um, you can use any kind of basket or shape as long as it fits on the top of a rain barrel. So we use these square ones, but other people use like small circular ones, for example. Um, and then other ones, the entire lid just can screw off and um, you would just put your screen over the top uh, of that and you wouldn't need to do any sort of cutting. Um, and this is what it looks like to drill holes in the barrel. It's This is just like a really funny uh, experience. You just kind of have to hop on the top of the barrel. It's a two person job. Um, and then one person stabilizes the barrel while another person drills the holes. Um, <clears throat> and you kind of have to like force it in a bit. Like you really have to, I don't know. It was, this is also one of my first times using power tools like this. So, um, yeah, this was, it was pretty fun and interesting. It's a really good family activity, I think. Um, and then what you have to do is you take your overflow and your faucet and you're going to wrap this ridged part in plumber's tape. You want to wrap it at least tw uh, two times and this is going to help create that seal with the barrel. Um, then what you're going to do is you're going to screw them into those two holes that you um, created. This can be quite difficult actually, so you might need to like really like force it in um, or use some tools to help you. Um, and then once you you are able to screw them in, uh, just a, something to consider is that you just want your faucet to be straight uh, so that you can uh, properly get water out of it. Another thing I forgot to mention earlier is that with the overflow, it doesn't necessarily have to be um, in line with your faucet. Some people um, connect their rain barrels in series, so next to each other, and so they'll put their overflow on the side of the barrel rather than the front of the barrel where the faucet is. Um, so it's really just up to you and how you want to create your rain barrel system. Uh, then you put on the lock nuts, and this is really a challenge. So it's pretty easy to put that on the back of the overflow, which is at the top of the barrel. But um, to put that on the back of the faucet is really a challenge. Um, when I was doing this, my face was like pushed up against the fa the the barrel, kind of like um, this ambassador Amanda here, just kind of like it's so awkward. And if you have long arms, that's extra helpful in this process. Um, and then once you get those on, you're going to use uh, silicone caulk um, on both the outside and the inside. So usually what we do is we'll just put on some gloves for this, um, disposable gloves, and then you put the caulk around it and then you kind of just like smear it all around it with your gloved hand. And then you do the same thing on the inside of the barrel. Again, this is really difficult to do for the faucet down at the bottom of the barrel, especially if this is a barrel that doesn't have one of those screw off lids. Um, and so once you create this um, nice seal, 
then you'll put in your screen. So here's an example of one of the barrels that has a screw off lid. You would just get a piece of screen that's big enough to cover this and you need some extra overhang over the side. So when you go and put that lid back over it, it stays nice and sealed with that screen. Um, if you have a rain barrel, like the ones I was showing earlier, that the ambassadors uh, made or something like this where you have a little hole in a little basket, you need to make sure that you wrap the basket in screening before you put the basket in because your goal with the screening is not only to catch, make sure debris isn't getting in there, but it's also to help prevent bugs and mosquitoes and such from getting in there. So always put a screen on it. And you don't always have to use a basket either. That's another thing. You can actually just cover this hole with uh, screening. You don't even have to use the basket if you don't want to. Uh, the next step is um, to name your rain barrel and welcome it into your family. Uh, some people will paint their rain barrels. And so I took the liberty of naming these. Uh, the one on the left I named Rain 2D2 and the one on the right I named Lorraine because what is life without puns? Uh, step eight is to create a platform. Uh, so more likely than not, your yard is not going to be level. So you want to go out into your yard, find a good spot for it, good downspout, and then you want to level out the ground. So you might have to dig a little bit, um, and then you'll create the platform. Now you can use stuff that you have lying around at home, or you can go out to the store and buy stuff to do this. Um, a lot of people uh, I've noticed use, they use quite raised, like at least a foot off the ground um, so that they can put things underneath the rain barrel, like buckets or something to transport water and stuff. So um, you can build one of these platforms out of um, wood, or you can use something like cement uh, blocks or bricks to create a platform. Uh, you just want to make sure that it's stable um, and that it's sturdy because it needs to be able to hold that rain barrel when it's full. And a full 55 gallon rain barrel weighs over 400 pounds. Um, so again, just make sure that whatever platform you choose, um, that it's sturdy. I think if you're going for like ease of install, probably cement blocks are probably your best bet uh, since you can just kind of stack them um, in, in the area um, and you don't really have to build anything crazy. The next step is to um, cut your your gutter downspout. So for the most part, gutter downspouts are going to go down the length of the house and then kind of curve out um, and then, you know, flow into the yard. So you want to put your, you want to level your yard and put your platform under your chosen downspout. And then you want to put your rain barrel on top of it. And then you're going to use uh, the top of the rain barrel as a reference point of how much you need to cut your um, gutter. Um, you can use different tools to do this. Um, but uh, one thing I do know is that you just want to measure precisely so that you don't cut off too much of your gutter um, and run into an issue there. So the saying we have in the ambassadors program is to measure twice, cut once. Um, so again, you want the, the downspout to curve and that curving part to end at the top of the rain barrel so the water comes out and empties here. Um, one of the more favorable options is to actually just cut your gutter and then attach a new flexible downspout. And you can attach these pieces with a gutter band um, to attach them to each other and to the house. Um, you can also, depending on how you can maneuver this and the, the kind of like the angle of the downspout, you can still use this and you can just cut the gutter, um, cut a big chunk of the, cut it off from here and then also cut another chunk off to create your own um, downspout. But if it's too short, then you will need to buy something like a flexible uh, downspout or elbow, right? And the last step is to just get jazzy with it. Uh, have fun with it. A lot of people uh, will actually create a system of rain barrels where they'll have them in series to collect lots of water. Um, so this might be a really good option if you have a lot of gardens, for example. So these three barrels, you can't really see it too well in this uh, picture here, um, but they're connected by a series of uh, PVC pipes under here. Um, and then this is the overflow. 
So this is going into the top of the rain barrel here, and it's filling up these barrels in series using this these connected tubes. So it's kind of going like a tube like this and a tube like this, and then it juts out and it has that one common faucet. Um, so again, you can be creative with this. Not everybody's going to do this. Other people will connect uh, like a hose, for example, to the bottom of the rain barrel, um, or they won't even have like a piping system like this for the overflow. Um, it's also not necessary if you don't want to get that fancy. Um, but I also thought that if you did want to get fancy, this is a really pretty example of a rain barrel that I think has a nice aesthetic appeal to it. So if you don't want to paint a rain barrel, but you do want to kind of camouflage it a bit, if you don't want like this big blue barrel in your yard, you can um, you can attach wood planks to it and you can decorate it with some rope or you can even paint the wood or something like that. So it's really up to you and um, how you want to use your rain barrel and decorate it and set up your system. Um, so for this presentation, I got most of this information from the Rutgers Rainwater Harvesting with Rain Barrels Trainer Manual, which you can get online. Um, and here's the Rutgers um, Agricultural Experimental Station website, njaes.ruckers.edu. They're an excellent resource, not just for rainwater harvesting and rain barrels, but they're a great resource for um, the other topics that we've covered throughout this workshop series. I also realized that in the previous um, presentations, I never provided my email. So if you do have questions about anything or you need help getting in contact um, with somebody to help you with a backyard project, um, you can always email me at wma2.njwap at gmail.com. Um, I did also want to throw out there that I'm looking to plan a rain barrel um, workshop series uh, like where you actually make your own rain barrel so if that's something that you would really like to do or be notified of um, please just uh, put your email in the chat box so I can save that and I can email you when that opportunity becomes available. Um, one thing to note about any rain barrel workshop is that either it's it's going to be sponsored by somebody or they're going to sponsor it and also charge a fee. Um, so uh, I'm not sure what the average fee is if they do charge it, but it, uh, all the supplies to make a rain barrel cost around like 20 plus dollars. So I can't imagine it would be any less than that. So um, if you're going to build it yourself, it'll cost about, you know, that amount of money unless you need to buy bigger quantities of supplies. For example, maybe something comes in a pack of three, even though you only need one. Um, but again, if this is something you're interested in and you'd really like to get on board with making your own rain barrel and putting one in your own yard, um, you can drop your email in the chat. Um, and with that, I just wanted to, so when we had our rain barrel workshop as ambassadors, uh, we decided to be fun and make this rain barrel video. Um, I just thought this was a good example of getting jazzy with rain barrels. Um, and with that, oh my gosh, how do I change the slide? Here we go. And with that, that's the end of the presentation. Um, if you're uh, here for the winter reading points on Read Squared, the code for this presentation is downpour, one word, um, all uppercase. Um, so with that,